Good afternoon. Thanks for joining Washington, D.C.-based Jennifer Strauss & Associates in our Get Far Sighted in 2020 complimentary webinar series. As you know, the FAR, or Federal Acquisition Regulations, is the rulebook that the federal government must follow when making purchases. Our webinar series pulls from the contracting experts to explain each part of the FAR. It is complimentary and recorded. We will post all of the recordings on our website and YouTube channel, where we have over 300 government contracting webinars available for download. A special thanks to our webinar partner in the series, the National Veteran Small Business Coalition Education Foundation. Please visit their website to learn more about the organization. We would also like to thank our friends at Open the FAR for their sponsorship. If your organization is interested in sponsoring the series or one part, please contact hello at jennifershouse.com. And now a little bit about us. We work with primarily large businesses to help them navigate the federal marketplace. We work with both product and service companies as well as software firms. Our clients span the globe and include publicly traded organizations in a variety of sectors. We provide market analysis reports, contract administration, contract vehicle assistance, and more. All of our services can also be built into a training course for your team. Learn more about us on our website. Now we would like to let you know about some ways to reach government, government contractors through us. We offer advertising and sponsorship opportunities through our weekly newsletter and also in our webinar series. For pricing or to place an order, please email us at hello at jennifershouse.com. Now let's move on to learn a bit about today's speaker, Adam Munitz. You can find his contact information here. And say we are covering FAR Part 16 with Adam. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really thank you for your participation in the series. Please let me know when you're ready for your next slide. Thanks very much. Um, as Arna mentioned, my name is Adam Munitz. I'm a partner at FHH Law Firm based out of Tysons, Virginia. Uh, I've spent a long time working with government contractors, and our firm as a whole has uh, spent decades working with government contractors of various sizes. We work with individuals, small businesses, medium businesses, large companies, multinationals. Overall, um, you know, we've been successful because of the practical, straightforward approach that we always take with matters. And I'd, I'd like to take that kind of practical and straightforward approach today. Um, to that end, I'd like to thank one of my colleagues in the GovCon practice, Rachel Leahy, for putting together some really great practical slides. Um, I think that her significant experience across the government contract spectrum uh, comes through in these slides. So without further ado, um, I'll begin. Next slide, please. Part 16 is, is a large part and because it covers all of the contract types, and there are many. Um, we're going to be focusing on most of them today. There, there are a few that, that we won't touch on, um, specifically uh, cost contracts and a few others, but we're focusing on the ones that are, are predominant in the, in the GovCon space. And you know, we're allotted 40 minutes. I think we might uh, run just short of that. We're trying to just give you as, as accurate a snapshot as possible. One thing to understand for those of you that have not spent too much time in the government contracting space is that one of the most, most unique aspects of government contracting is the asymmetry of power. Um, there's always, to some extent, a, a disproportionality um, is, you know, in terms of the allocation of power in commercial contracts. But in government contracts, um, it, it's totally asymmetric. Um, the government has most of the power and um, it, it wields it as, it as it wishes to. And so with respect to these contract types, it's the contracting officer, it's the government that selects the contracting type on any given opportunity. And that's, that's you know, there's a misconception out there that the contractor somehow has a role in, it, in that process and can choose the contracting type. That is sometimes the case, um, you know, where there's a, a fully baked, um, steady relationship with the contractor, perhaps they might seek government, uh, contractor input on the contract type. But in general, for the most part, it's the contracting officer and the government that will select the contract type. The other nuance I'd like to mention before we really dive into the contract types is that FAR Part 16 is all about risk. It's all about allocation of risks. And each contract type is tied to a certain allocation of risk. So it's incumbent upon the contractor, given that it doesn't select the contract type, to determine how best it can mitigate the risks presented by the type of contract selected by the government. What I'm going to do now is look at, look at the sliding scale of risk, the sliding scale of contract types from most risky to the government contractor 
to least risky. And we'll look at a few other types in between um, that, that are somewhat hybrids. Next slide, please. So the highest risk type of contract for, for contractors, and thus lowest risk for the, for the government, is a fixed price contract, under which the contractor agrees to provide a product or service at a fixed price. Um, we'll look at a few instances in which there's some flexibility, but in general, under fixed price contracts, there is no flexibility. And as such, the contractor bears the risk of increased cost of performance. Um, given that there is no flexibility, um, the risk is on them to perform. They know what the cost is, and it's on them to ensure that they provide their goods or services at or below that cost. Fixed price contracts are generally suitable for the purchase of commercial items, purchase of supplies or services where detailed specifications are available, or the provision of supplies or services by highly efficient process-oriented contractors. And what unifies all these different scenarios is, again, the level of risk. With commercial products, where detailed specifications are available, with process-oriented contractors, everyone's aligned in terms of what's expected. So it's not necessary to have a more flexible contract vehicle. I would note, as, as you have at the bottom of the slide here, that increasingly we are seeing um, fixed price contracts for high risk experimental or developmental programs, you know, such as for newly prototyped technology. And what will happen in these instances is that the government is working with, uh, with a really nuanced, um, sometimes futuristic issue. It's high risk for them. They don't really know what they're working with. And they're looking for a partner in the in industry that will share that risk with them, that's willing to, you know, put their hat in the ring um, despite the fixed price nature and maybe, you know, use it as a loss leader in, in the interest of developing a longer term relationship. Um, so in those instances, it's an opportunity for, for fast growing medium sized or small contractors to bear that risk in the interest of developing a, you know, a longer term contract. Obviously, you know, it's not in the interest of larger contractors to take advantage of this kind of scenario. For those of you that are listening that are small or medium sized businesses, Look out for these types of situations. Um, they can be beneficial. Next slide, please. The most inflexible type of firm fixed price contract is the firm fixed price contract, the FFP. Um, here, there, the price is not suitable to adjustments. Um, there, there's, there's no flexibility. There's, there are no circumstances under which the, the pricing would change or the cost would change. Um, it's a minimum administrative burden on either party, and thus the contractor has the maximum incentive to control its cost because, again, there, there's, there's no flexibility. From a risk mitigation standpoint, in order to minimize your risk under an FFB contract, um, you should ensure that the contract requirements are actually achievable, um, they're sufficiently defined, and that there's no ambiguity or sub subjective judgment with respect to what the government is looking for. Um, that's the best way to ensure that you, you perform at or below the firm fixed price. Next slide, please. That said, there are two types of fixed price contracts where there is some degree of, of um, flexibility. It's still fixed price, that the price won't change, but there are various um, mechanisms built in to account for change circumstances. And the first, as we see here under FAR 16.203, is fixed price contracts with economic price adjustments. And that provides for a change in the contract price, whether upward or perhaps downward, you should know it can be downward, based on the occurrence of specified contingencies. So under these circumstances, the contract would lay out certain contingencies, certain circumstances under which there could be an economic price adjustment. And the adjustment could be based on, as noted here, the price of specified items, um, the actual cost of specified labor or material, or perhaps changes in labor or material costs. Um, and you know, when you might expect to see this kind of hybrid, so to speak, is where there are ec economic conditions um, that result in significant fluctuations in labor and material. So again, just to emphasize, still fixed price, but there's some room for flexibility based on changed economic conditions, but on the occurrence of specified contingencies. Next slide, please. Conversely, there's another mechanism called a contract redetermination. So unlike 
the fixed price contract with economic price adjustments, the fixed price contract with a redetermination mechanism allows for changes um, to a firm fixed price um, after an initial period. So the initial contract provides for a firm fixed price for an initial period of performance, and then a prospective redetermination at a stated time. So it's not so much contingency that, that triggers this mechanism as it is a, a timeline. So at a certain point, um, the, the parties, the, the government, and the contractor have an opportunity to reconvene after that, you know, that set timeline and look at whether a, a pricing redetermination is appropriate. And again, this is where the economic conditions are such that it's possible to negotiate a fair price for initial term only. It's only reasonable that, um, that there be a fixed price for, for so long before the circumstances are such that the, um, that the, the pricing, that the, the cost should, should change. So again, two hybrids within the, the fixed price realm that allow for a certain degree of flexibility, but overall, these are, are relatively inflexible regimes. Next slide, please. Another type of firm fixed price contract, though, is the level of effort contract. And here, um, it's still fixed price, but the government is less focused on the actual results that are achieved than it is on the effort expended. So here, under this type of contracting vehicle, the contractor provides a specific number of lab labor hours. It is authorized to expend a certain amount of labor, labor, a certain amount of level of effort over a fixed period of time. And you see these when there's an investigation or study in a specific research or development area that the government requires. Um, they're not necessarily willing to award, as we'll discuss in a few minutes, a, a cost contract, cost reimbursement contract, which is much more flexible. Um, but there's enough unknown there that they just want to authorize a certain amount of time that the contractor can expend on, on the specific topic. And so that's a, a level of effort contract. Next slide, please. So, the highest risk contracting vehicle to the contractor, just to restate, is the fixed price contract. The least risky contracting vehicle is the cost reimbursement contract. And here, the government will simply pay the allowable incurred costs. And there is a funding ceiling, right, so that the government can, can cap its risk somehow, but there's not a fixed price per se. And obviously, under, you know, under this scenario, the government bears the majority of the risk and the contractor simply used its best efforts. Now, as a side note, there are risk mitigation mechanisms or, or, or strategies that the contractor can implement on fixed price contracts. The obvious question is, how does the government uh, minimize its risk under these cost reimbursement contracts? Well, it does so by requiring rigorous cost accounting standards. And I'm sure that um, Jennifer and her team have provided uh, webinars on cost accounting standards um, or, or, or will do so later this year. But those are incredibly complex standards um, that require the, the contractor to prove to a significant degree of detail exactly how they arrive at their costs and to justify um, their costs in, in various ways. So, I mean, it's not completely open-ended. There's, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of restrictions that, that keep the, the contractor within, within a box, but that said, it's still not a fixed price contract. And the government typically deploys these kinds of vehicles when it's unable to estimate and therefore prove costs with sufficient accuracy to use any type of fixed price contract. So they don't really, the government doesn't really know exactly what the, uh, what the specifications are, what the requirements are, um, down to a granular level of detail that would be necessary for a fixed price contract. So what I'd like to do now is, is look at the, the different kinds of cost reimbursement contracts. Next slide, please. The first under FAR 16.306 is the cost plus fixed fee contract. And this is a contract that provides for payment to the contractor of a negotiated fee that's set out at the outset. Um, so this is the, you know, the least flexible of, um, of cost reimbursement uh, contracts that have a fee attached. It, it is established at the outset. Um, that doesn't vary based on actual cost. Can be adjusted if, as with any government contract if there is a, uh, a scope change, right? If there's a modification that's required. But otherwise, that fee, that incentive is set at the outset. And typically, you see this kind of contract where 
um, the contractor's performing research or preliminary exploration of a study, and the level of effort is, is simply unknown. Um, you see this with developmental and test programs as well, and it just that fixed fee is, is additional incentive for the contractor to, to meet its schedule and, and satisfy its requirements. And we'll talk a little bit more about incentives um, in a few minutes. Next slide, please. So, along those lines, um, incentive contracts are, are outlined in FAR subpart 16.4. And here, you know, the government understands to a certain extent its requirements, um, but there are specific acquisition objectives that it has. Um, there are certain circumstances that it, it either wants to achieve or wants to avoid, um, such as improved delivery, um, that is, you know, in heightened efficiency, um, advanced technical performance, cost management or some other significant parameter. Under those circumstances, the government might be willing to incentivize the contractor as well, either under a fixed price contract or a cost reimbursement contract. Next slide, please. So, so what are these incentives? What incentives are we talking about? Well, they generally fall into four different categories. The first, and I'll just run through these, are cost incentives, is the most common. And if actual costs are lower than target costs, the contractor's fee increases. Conversely, if costs are higher, the fee decreases. Now, the second are performance or quality incentives. Right here, it's, it's a more, it's more substance focus. It's less focused on costs, more on, on, on quality. And the profit or fee is tied to the achievement of uncertain but desirable results as compared with the target. Um, so aircraft speed or vehicle maneuverability are, are two of the examples we cited here. Uh, delivery incentives, right? Timeliness um, is the third type of incentive. Here, an improvement in the delivery schedule will result in additional profit. And then fourth is, is, is a mashup, right? Multiple incentives, uh, you know, various types in order to encourage performance, whether it's, you know, maybe it's cost and delivery, maybe it's performance and cost, maybe it's cost and delivery. It's just, it's, it's an amalgamation of, of those different incentives. Next slide, please. So as noted, you can have incentives um, with fixed price contracts or cost reimbursement contracts. Um, the fixed price incentive contract discussed at FAR subpart 16204 and 16403 is a fixed price contract that provides for adjusting profit and establishing the final contracting price by an application of formula based on the relationship of total final negotiated costs total target cost. So here the final price is subject to a price ceiling, and it's that ceiling that makes it a fixed price contract. This can get a little confusing. Anytime you're looking at incentives and the, the, the calculation it takes to establish that incentive, it can almost seem as if you're, you're outside the realm of a fixed price or cost reimbursement contract. But here it remains a fixed price contract because there is a price ceiling. And there are two types of specific uh, fixed price incentive contracts. The first is a firm target, and the second is a successive target fixed price contract, or fixed price incentive contract, rather. Um, we'll get to those in a minute. Um, just as background, you might see a fixed price incentive contract when the scope of work is insufficiently defined for a firm fixed price contract, but the performance risks are significantly or sufficiently understood that a contractor can agree to a fixed ceiling price. So let's look at those firm targets. That's a target contract. Next slide, please. Under a fixed price incentive firm target contract, the contract specifies a target cost, right? most importantly, target cost, also a target profit and a price ceiling, but not a profit ceiling, and a profit adjustment formula. And the price ceiling is the maximum that may be paid to the contractor, again, thus making it a fixed price contract. And the way these contracts work is that when the contractor completes performance, the parties negotiate the final cost. And if the final cost is less than the target cost, the final profit increases. If the final cost is more than the target cost, the final profit decreases. And if the final negotiated cost exceeds the price ceiling altogether, the contractor absorbs the difference as, as a loss. So relatively formulaic, um, the target cost notably is identified at the outset, unlike the fixed price incentive successive targets, which are discussed on the next slide, please. 
So here, the contract only specifies an initial target cost, target profit, and a profit adjustment formula. And the difference here from the fixed price incentive firm target contract is that the firm target costs and profits are determined not at the contract's inception, but at a later specified point during production. So again, it's not at the outset, it's during production. And these types of contracts where there are successive targets, where there are adjustments throughout you know, contract performance are generally appropriate um, when available cost or pricing information is insufficient to permit the negotiation of a realistic firm target up front, right? So the circumstances are such that that firm target just is, is, not, is not plausible. Next slide, please. Another type of incentive, incentive is the award fee. So you'll also find fixed price contracts with award fees. And here the focus is, is much more on contract performance. Um, it's, it's still formulaic, but it's not quite as formulaic as, as the, the incentive contracts are. And they allow for an award fee to be earned um, in addition to the fixed price, fixed price um, based on contract performance. That the contract performance, again, is, is the incentive. And it's much more open-ended. It's, it's more flexible, even though it's still a fixed price contract. And generally, you see these types of arrangements where the work is such that, that it's neither feasible nor effective to devise predetermined objective incentive targets, right? Um, it's just simply not plausible to identify those, those targets, whether they be related to cost or schedule or technical performance up front. That said, the government still wishes to incentivize timeliness or, or cost efficiency um, or certain uh, adherence to technical specifications um, without that type of precision. So they'll select these fixed price contracts with award fees under FAR subpart 16404 instead. Next slide, please. Again, as we noted at the outset, you can have incentive fee contracts that are fixed price or cost reimbursement. So this slide addresses cost plus incentive fee contracts under FAR subpart 16304 and 16405-1. And under these types of contracts, um, the government specifies a target cost, a target fee, minimum and maximum fees, and a fee adjustment formula. And the contract provides for the initially negotiated fee to be adjusted by a formula based on the relationship of total allowable costs to total target costs. It's that ratio that drives the incentive. And again, this, um, this will help incentivize, uh, you know, minimize costs um, while still working within a, a cost plus a cost reimbursement um, formula. And you'll frequently see these under services or development or test programs where, again, it, it's not commercial. Um, it's, it's not um, uh, recurring work that the government fully understands and doesn't fully understand the scope. Um, so cost reimbursement contract is appropriate. Nonetheless, due to the circumstances of the contract performance, the government wishes to incentivize certain types of behavior, whether that behavior be associated with timeliness or cost efficiency or technical specifications and adherence to those specifications. Next slide, please. The parallel to the fixed price award fee contract is the cost plus award fee contract. And as with the fixed price award fee contract here, the government still wishes to apply some sort of incentive, but the, um, the circumstances are not such that, that an incentive target can be um, specified with precision. So here you'll have a contract that provides a fee consisting of a base amount fixed at the inception of the contract. So that's your, your base amount fee plus an award that the contractor can earn in whole or in part during performance based on performance evaluation. So there will be periodic performance evaluations that will occur and the fee, the award fee, will accrue based on those evaluations. Next slide, please. So I'd like to step outside of this, this kind of rigid construct of, of fixed price versus cost reimbursement for a second um, and look at another type of, of contract called the indefinite, indefinite delivery uh, contract. Um, I think we started to see these more, more commonly about 20 years ago. Um, 20 years ago, they really became in, in vogue, so to speak. And they, they're interesting in the sense that the government 
understands one aspect of performance, but it doesn't understand another, right? So whereas under fixed price, it has you know almost total certainty on specifications and timeliness and costs and everything else, um, and whereas under cost reimbursement contracts, it, it lacks that certainty. Here, it's certain it's certain in uh, in some respects, but not others. So uh, there are two types of indefinite delivery um, contracts that we, we generally see overarching contract types. The first is a delivery order contract in which the government issues individual orders for the delivery of supplies during the period of the contract. And the second is a task order contract, which you're probably all more familiar with, under which the government issues orders for the performance of specific tasks during the period of the contract. And as a whole, as those of you might know some experience with these indefinite delivery contracts, whether it's primes or subs, the way these typically work is that the government will often issue an indefinite delivery contract to a variety of prime contractors. And then those prime contractors will compete for orders, delivery orders or task orders underneath that indefinite delivery contract umbrella. The three specific types of indefinite delivery contracts that I'd like to focus on today, um, whether they be delivery order or task order, are definite quantity contracts, requirements contracts, and indefinite quantity contracts. Next slide, please. So under definite quantity contract, um, the total quantity and price are specified for a fixed period. So the government knows exactly how much it's going to order, but it doesn't necessarily know when it needs it. And this type of vehicle under subpart 502 um, positions the government to issue delivery orders that specify the delivery date and location. And you'll frequently see this where um, definite quantity of supplies or services will be required during the contract period. And the supplies or services are regularly available or will be available after a short lead time. So this type of contract does not make sense if there is some, some degree of uncertainty as to whether there will be enough um, services or supplies available. Um, rather, that, that, that amount needs to be certain, and that availability needs to be certain. It's the time, again, that's in question. Next slide, please. Requirements contracts are another type of um, indefinite delivery contracts under subpart 503. And here, the government promises to order all the requirements, right? So there's, there's no question how much the government is going to order. It's going to require all require and order all, all requirements, um, and the contractor promises to fill all those requirements. So there's a mutual understanding there. Um, the government promises to order all, and the contractor promises to fill all. And the government schedules actual delivery, actual delivery of performance by placing orders with the contractor. And at the front end, in issuing the solicitation, the KO, the contracting officer, is obliged to state a realist, realistic estimate of the total quantity that it expects to order. It's not a commitment per se, but it's just a reasonable, um, good faith, realistic estimate. Just as an aside, the contract may also specify maximum or minimum quantities the government may order under each individual order and the maximum that it may order during a specified period of time. So when would you see these kinds of requirements and contracts under subpart 503? Well, they might be appropriate, as we know here, for acquiring any supplies or services when the government anticipates recurring requirements. Um, but it's unable to determine when precise quantities will be needed. It knows it's going to have recurring requirements. It just doesn't know um, when those requirements will need to be satisfied. So in those circumstances, a requirement contract would be appropriate. Next slide, please. This is another interesting version of the indefinite delivery contract. It's called an indefinite delivery indefinite quantity contract, an IDIQ, uh, as we often hear. So an indefinite quantity contract, an IDIQ, provides for an indefinite quantity within stated limits of supplies or services during a fixed period. So the timing is fixed. Um, there are stated limits on the amount of, of goods or services that can be ordered, but the, again, the quantity is indefinite. And in these circumstances, the government places orders for individual requirements. So it's not a recurring requirements contract. Um, and those quantity limits can be stated in terms of number of units or dollar values, but the government must order a stated minimum quantity. And that gives the contractor the, you know, some degree of assurance regarding the quantity that will be ordered, and it in turn must deliver up to the, up to the stated maximum quantity. When do you see these IDXUs? So typically, you see these where the government cannot determine above a specified minimum 
the precise quantities of, or supply the services that it will, will require. And just as a matter of policy, the government prefers to make an award to multiple contractors, as we've noted, who then compete for individual task orders. So again, you'll see these IDIQs issued to a large number of primes, um, unlike other types of contracting vehicles where the award's made to a single party, and then all those primes will compete for specific um, task orders and delivery orders under that IDIQ umbrella. So it's a somewhat cumbersome contracting vehicle, but it does allow for um, contracts to be issued where, again, the um, exact amount that's being delivered, or the timing that it's, uh, the peer performance, or rather the, uh, the sequence in which performance will occur is not necessarily known. Next slide, please. I'd like to briefly touch on um, another type of contracting vehicle that, that's unique, and there's a time and materials, labor hour, and letter contract under subpart 16.6. So time and materials contracts and labor hour contracts, to be clear, are not fixed price contracts. Um, instead, the government simply requires that a certain number of labor hours be performed regardless of whether the effort results in, you know, the accomplishment of the identified task, right? So it, again, the government is trying to cap its risk by focusing on, on the time that the contractor spends performing the contract, um, but it's not quite a fixed price contract. Next slide, please. So there are two, two types here that we'll quickly look at. Um, the first is the time materials contract which provides for acquiring supplies or services on the basis of labor hours, um, including all costs of benefits and actual cost of materials. And the contractor order includes a ceiling price the contractor exceeds its own risk. So that's one type. Um, the other under subpart 602 is the labor hour contract, um, which is you know, a variation of the time materials contract, except that, um, that you know, materials are not supplied by the contractor. So, so when would you expect to see this type of time materials contract or labor hour contract? Um, well, you'd see it where um, it's not possible at the contract exception to estimate accurately or with precision the extent of duration of the work or to anticipate the cost with any reason to degree of confidence. Instead, the government would prefer to allocate a certain number of labor hours that the contractor can expend. Next slide, please. So the letter contract um, is utilized by the government where it immediately requires contract performance, but a full contract cannot be executed. Time simply does not um, allow for that. And it's a written preliminary contractual instrument that authorizes the contractor to begin performance immediately before the definitive contract is signed. And we would note it is a binding agreement not an agreement to agree. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it is an actual contract, and um, it's typically used when the government's interests, again, require that the contractor be given a binding commitment so the work can start immediately, um, where negotiating a definitive contract is, is simply not possible to meet the government's requirements. Under those circumstances, a letter contract would be um, issued typically where there's some degree of urgency. Next slide, please. Uh Conversely, um, you have basic agreements under subpart 702, um, housed under 16.7. And a basic agreement is a written instrument of understanding negotiated between the government and the contractor that contain, contains terms and conditions that will apply to future contracts between the parties during the term of the agreement. So it is essentially an agreement to agree. It's not, notably, a contract, unlike a letter contract. And it contemplates that future contracts will incorporate those terms and conditions agreed upon in the base agreement. This is somewhat unusual contracting vehicle because it's because of its non-binding nature, which leads to the obvious question: Why would you use it? And when? Well, the government typically uses it when um, a number of separate contracts may be awarded to a contractor during a particular period, and um, there may have been significant recurring problems with the contractor. Under those circumstances. There are going to be a number of separate contracts. Um, there have been recurring problems. Some sort of basic agreement, non-binding basic agreement that sets up a framework for future contracts um, would be prudent. Next slide, please. 
So here what we've done is we've, we've tried to bring this all together by, by showing, you the full, showing you the full sliding scale of contracts um, listed in order from the most risky to the least risky. And as we discussed at the top, you have the firm fixed price contract. At the bottom, you have the cost plus fixed fee level of effort, effort, level of effort contract. And between, you have the other vehicles we, we've discussed with the exception of, of the agreements and the, and the IDIQs. But this just demonstrates for you um, how the risk is allocated so that if you are, again, if you're new to government contracting, you receive a contract, you don't really understand how the risk is allocated, this should give you a sense of um, how the risk has been distributed between the government and your company. Next slide, please. In closing, um, we provided a variety of resources that we think would be useful to all of you as you continue down this government contracting path. Um, I encourage you to review FAR Part 16 in detail, work with your council, as you, you know, propose these contracts and, and receive these contracts. Um, we are available to answer any questions or concerns um, that you may have about this presentation. If you'd like to dive into any of these contract types in greater detail, I encourage you to contact us. Um, our contact information is located on the next slide. Um, please feel free to reach out via um, phone or email. Uh, again, I want to thank Jennifer and her team for uh, including us in today's webinar. And um, we look forward to hearing from those of you that would like to discuss this matter further. Thanks for a great presentation, Adam. We really appreciate your participation in the series. Uh, to our audience members, thanks for joining us. And if you have any questions about this specific part of the FAR, uh, our speaker's contact information is on the screen here. If you have any questions about federal contracting or need assistance with any of our services, please contact us directly. Thank you again for joining us, and this concludes today's webinar.